All right, copepods. If you look at the nature of copepods, the variety of lifestyles and the variety of their, their shapes and everything else, they really do fit biodiversity in action. Because this group includes planktonic copepods, shows other members of the plankton that live on organisms, shows copepods that live in soil and, and burrow in it, in sand, copepods that must live with other organisms, but don't hurt them, supposedly. And finally, copepods that are truly parasitic. So all that in this one group. Now, if you go swimming in the ocean, or in a lake, or even in a big river, whether you like it or not, you're going to be swimming with copepods. And the beauty of that, it sounds like swimming with dolphins or swimming with whales or something. But the minor problem with that is copepods are tiny. They range in size from less than half a millimeter to over eight millimeters, just over eight millimeters. And even that little picture up the top is, is way out of line in terms of size. Because if I make it the same size, you see that little dot to the left of the MM? That's the size that, that the copepod would be. So my question is, how can something so very small be so very important? And the fact is that we know that copepods play very important roles in aquatic environments. So I'm going to be discussing some of these roles and some of the things in three basic topics. First is, where do copepods live? Second, what do they do? How do they make a living? Third, why are they important? Now I brought a friend with me, and here, here it comes. And that friend doesn't have a name yet. And what I need from, from someone in the audience is an idea of what, what you could name him or her. We're not sure. Let's wait. Let's do the, the, the name at the end. So you think about it, and we'll get, get your input then. OK. Let's first look at the, the word copepod. What does it mean? Well, the first part of it, that C-O-P-E, means oar, something that rows a boat with. The second means foot. So they're oar-footed. That sounds weird. But if we look at a pair of legs from a copepod that are joined together and work together as a pair of oars would when you row a boat, and then we put a small boat there with the oars, you can begin to see what that word copepod means. And when we put it in terms of a real organism, one that is really common out in our waters, and with changes in, in climate becoming increasingly more common, you can see that there are pairs of oars that form their feet. Now, you're going to see organisms with this kind of color, or with a kind of a, a reddish color. And I want you to keep in mind that color is something I did to those organisms. Because if I look at an organism, it doesn't look like much until I stain it and I clear it. Now I can begin to see detail. And if I look at the side view of one of these stained organisms, you can see the muscles. See the muscle fibers coming to each of the legs. You can see the digestive tract and food in it. So staining and clearing is something that I do. But when you see that, you know, hey, Lewis has been working with it. And it's not a true color. Now the question is, do color, true colors occur in planktonic organisms? And there's an example of the kind of colors that you see in some of these. Not all of them, but some of them. So this is the group I'm going to discuss first, just in a brief discussion. Plankton are organisms that occur in the water, lakes, streams, big streams, and certainly the ocean. They occur at all depths in the water column. And they're unique because they don't have much capability to move so that they're moved around by the currents. And the currents dictate where they go. 
Now, how can they do this? How can they make a living in, in, in the uh, ocean? Well, first of all, they can't sink too fast, or else they'll sink out of where they make their living. So they're small. That's a good thing. Second, there's a lot of surface area there. So it acts like a parachute and helps the organisms to stay up in the water bowl. Third, a lot of them, in fact, most of them have oil in them in one form or another. And this helps to buoy them up. And when we look at one of these copepods, and we look at all the projections that occur, see the, the two hair-like processes coming off the back end on the left-hand side, and you see the appendages on the other, all of them have these expansions of surface area. And if we look at certain parts of them, we see that there are certain spines that are present too. So not only do these processes help them stay afloat or in the water column, they also protect the organism because who would want to bite on something like that? Now, the second group of, of animals that I'm going to talk about are those copepods that live on or near the bottom. And this is an old friend of mine. I've worked with it quite a bit. No, I guess it's his friend too, or her friend. So the thing about these organisms is that they live in weird environments. They can tolerate a great deal of impact on them. This copepod that I just shown, Tig, lives in that little tiny pool right next to the camera case. You'll also find them right at that sand water interface, either running around on top of the sand or actually burrowing in. You'll even find them in a situation like this. Now think about it. These young people are stirring that sand and, and mud up. The copepods would ultimately love it because it's stirring up mud for them and getting nutrients and, and food out for them. You also find these very tolerant organisms living in what we call hydrothermal vents. Volcanic areas where the water temperature can get well above 100 degrees Celsius. So they're extremely tolerant and that can produce a problem. But these organisms occur in a whole array of situations. The colors in the lower two <clears throat> are artificial from people working on them. The color in the upper left one is a true color. And one on the right, look at the spine on its front end. And a spine on the rear end too, actually. That one lives attached to either small sand grains or tiny little plants. The problem that comes up is because of these, the tolerance of these organisms, now this one was taken from a, a big tank inside a large commercial vessel. When these commercial vessels load up with water in their home port, they pick up a lot of small organisms. And then when they go on their trips all over the world, they carry those organisms with them. Now these are organisms that have become familiar with the place where they were loaded. But when they're released at the port where the, the water is, is dumped, they can sometimes take over the habitat. And this produce a, produces a problem because ballast water <clears throat> is the largest source of invertebrates, including coke pods, that, can, that infects Canada's waterways. They actually replace organisms that are very useful to us or useful to the organisms near our coast. And Canada and a number of other countries have formed task forces to try and minimize the effect of these things. All right, <clears throat> enough on near benthic copepods. Let's talk about the ones that live with other organisms. Now, you, you notice at the top I say, but don't hurt them. Now, I've got it in very tiny print, and I've got quotes around it. What this means is I can't visualize something like that living with me or on me, not being ticklish or something else. So the term don't hurt them is a requirement for this group, but it's hard to believe sometimes. And these copepods live in or on other animals. The one on the lower portion 
is really unique. The female, when she's very young, lands on a piece of coral and causes that coral to grow around her. And she lives in that cyst her entire life. Just like living in a cage, I guess. And the final group that I will discuss, and at some length, are those that are parasitic. These are organisms that absolutely require a host. And in this case, this is the sea louse that's found on our, our common salmon. And you'd think from looking at that mess that it would be extremely painful and it would be a problem that the fish would like to get rid of. Well, that's true to a certain case, but all fish have parasitic overlaps. Natural to them. You look at a, a tang or acanthurus, the, the surgeon fish, and you'll find a specific group of copepods. You look at a set of sharks, each species of shark will tend to have its own group of copepods, parasites. The same with tunas, the same with deep sea fishes. So I'm saying, number one, they're natural to the fish. Number two, they're unique to the fish. Now, some of them are weird. Believe it or not, those two are two parasitic copepods females with egg strings, the string-like structures at the end. Here are four living in the eye of a halibut, or a halibut-like, a flatfish anyway. So they are unique and they live on certain parts of the fish. Now the question that somebody would ask is, how can these unique parasites possibly be related to planktonic forms? How can that beast on the right be related to the free living copepod on the left? Well, in, in order to determine that, you've got to go back to the life history. This is the life history of a free living planktonic copepod. Set in all layer stages, the little guys with fuzz on them. And the last one, when it gets ready, molts into the first copepod. I don't have a pointer, so I apologize for this. The, uh, so it changes from that form into one that looks something like the adult. And then it gradually changes through molts, shedding its skin, into something that looks like the full adult. Now if we look at the life history of a parasitic form, you see basically the same thing. They've modified it quite a bit. They've dropped those not bare stages, so they only have two of them. They've gone into that first couple of stage, and then they have to find a host. Without that, they'll die. From then on out, the change that occurs is not looking like a free living coat, but one that looks like that parasitic form. So when we look at that life history, basically, it has the same components of the free living one. Now, pity the poor fish. If you look, I'm going to go over there and show some of this. There are, see those white bars, like the, the egg strings of, of a copepod. There are over 20 parasitic copepods on that little guy. I should think that would be very uncomfortable. So the question, what can the fish do about it? Well, if the fish lives, near a coral reef, he'll run around and look for something like this. This is a tiny little fish. It's about the size of my finger. And it eats copepods, eats parasitic copepods. What happens is that, well, these are called doctor fish or cleaner fish. What happens is that the large fish with parasitic copepods on it comes in and comes near the site that a pair of these little tiny fish have set up. And there may be two or three fish waiting to be cleaned. So there's a lineup for this doctor fish. And the little one works over the surface of the fish. And then the big fish opens its mouth. And in goes the cleaner fish. It cleans off the inside too. Now, sooner or later, that big fish has to breathe. And this could be a somewhat disastrous for the little fish. So when it, before it breathes, it, it coughs just a bit. 
and out zips the, the clinger fish. Goes off to the side so it won't be inhaled. It waits till the, the big fish has, has um, exhaled and inhaled enough. Then it opens its mouth again and back in it goes. And they do this for some pretty serious predators too. So it's, it's a wonderful relationship that allows that little fish with over 20 copepods on it to get rid of most of them. There are other fish that do this, not directly like that clinger fish does. But the remorants, which are fish that have a modified dorsal surface, it's made up from the, the fin, and they hang on sharks, they hang on great big manta rays, and they'll actually clean the parasites off. Now the, the remora on the shark would much rather eat what's left over from the, from the shark feeding, but it will eat parasitic copepods. There are clinger shrimp that do the same thing. I mean, that must tickle. <laughs> I imagine the moray eel is pretty happy with having the, the uh, things cleaned off. And even some of the reef fishes will do it. So what this says is, this is a good thing, all right? That the, I don't think they go around with squirt guns, but anyway, <laughs> they, they can clean up the fish, whether it's a, a great big shark or a very, very small fish. Now, this little summary of all the four major lifestyles suggests then that copepods really are diverse and have a remarkable set of lifestyles that they can follow. But planktonic copepods we know are extremely important to global ecology. They're usually the dominant forms. Some people feel they are the most common form. So the question is, what do they do? Well, the energy that they transfer in the food chain, which is transfer of energy, is energy obtained from the sun sucked up by the plants through their chlorophyll. And then the animals eat that and transfer the energy into the animal end of the thing. And then that recycles back into the nutrients that feed the, the plants. So I'm going to talk about two different environments. The first, I'm going to talk about food chain, just very general things. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about the Alaska blunt humpback whale and it's part of the food web, the intricacies of the food which it eats. So here's, here's our wonderful coral reef environment. Would somebody please show me where the copepods are? Can you see any copepods? Well, of course not. They're all tiny. So what we have to do is to look at little samples of water with a microscope or with a very large magnifying lens in order to first see that plant end of things, the phytoplankton. And then we have to look at the, the, the algae, to look at the benthic plants and animals. So we see coral and algae, which can make up more than 60% of a reef at times, and the, the algae that actually live in the coral. And then, lo and behold, when we go back and we take that same sample from the water column uh, above the reef, and we look at, at the magnifying lens, up, we see all these copepods. There are a few that aren't copepods that are the ones that are orange. But the majority of them are copepods. And then we go to near the bottom and we find the same thing. We find near benthic copepods. Well then, the fish know this. They know where the copepods are. Whether they sense them with chemicals or whether they sense them with, by modifications of the environment, we don't know for sure. But they can find them. And there are large fish which chew on the coral and pick up the small organisms that live on the coral itself. So this basically is the environment. We've got phytoplankton, plant plankton, and zooplankton, the animal plankton in the water. We've got the near benthic plants and animals in the bottom. And we've got the fish feeding on them. Now you notice I was very selective. I picked a fish that has a parasitic copepods on it. And that's because we have to have that fourth, fourth nature. Okay. Now the humpback whale. The humpback whale is a very common large mammal, marine mammal, off our coast, 
at certain times of year and off the coast of Alaska. And the food web that makes use of starts with the phytoplankton, the diatoms, and the dinoflagellates, the zooplankton, herring, and humpback. So my question is, how much of that 40-ton whale is made up of protein from the cobalt? Now, the humpback whale also eats other things. It eats clams and other things from the bottom. It'll eat, before, uh, you eat another type of planktonic organism as well. But all of those, at some stage in their life, will eat copepods. So copepod protein becomes extremely important. And the role that they play in the food web of the humpback whale is critical. Now, there are always problems because the same situation doesn't hurt, occur all year long. With seasonal changes, the availability of those copepods to the herring change. We can also change that by impacting the environment. And a classical example of that is the herring loss from the Alaskan Exxon Valdez oil spill. Within the area of the oil spill, 50% of the herring were lost. Over the 20 years since then, herring have started to recover. Now the humpbacks have noted this. And as a result, there's been an increase in humpback feeding on the, on the herring. And what this does is to reduce the herring recovery now. Now when the oil hit, it also affected the, the food web of the, of the herring and the food web of the humpback whale. And if we look at what happens with an oil spill, if it's a light oil, it will impact the surface organisms. It will impact the birds, the mammals, the marine mammals, and so forth. But if it's an, a heavy oil or bitumen, it will impact the water column as well. It will not only wipe out part of the food web, but it will also affect the, the benthic organisms. And I put something up that I think is worthwhile repeating it at this stage with what's happening down here. The initial impact on the surface is the, the effect on the seabirds, the sea otters, the seals, and the marine mammals, and the yorker whales. But there's also an initial impact on the water column. The salmon eggs were lost, herring eggs were lost, 50% of the population, and they include the copepods. And in 2010, after 21 years, there's still oil, and it is still toxic. All right, enough of the nasties. One of the last two things I'd like to talk about are how copepods obtain food. Let's look at, at uh, what they can eat. Copepods can eat plants or animals. They can eat detritus, in other words, the leftovers, or they, they can eat all of the above. We could have what's called a copepod cafe out there. Food for everyone. And it actually does occur, seasonally controlled and everything else. But you get that kind of copepod cafe. So it's a, it's a neat idea, and it's something that's kind of neat to think, of, think about. So I'll talk about two examples. The first is, a, is an organism that eats everything, and you've seen something about this already. And the second is a herbivore. The first organism is tick, the one that I've talked about, and my friend has mentioned too. And uh, tig lives in these pools, and these pools are tiny. There were about 40 specimens of tig in there. Now it doesn't receive food from the seawater all the time, it's just through spray. It relies on stuff that grows in that little tiny patch. See that off-color material? That's food growing there. It also relies on stuff that falls in. And so it, it has to be able to eat bacteria. Now, think of the tooth structure and the mouth structure that has to be present. It eats the microalgae, the little tiny algae, little tiny cells, which you can clearly see there, which come in primarily from the ocean. It eats marine fungi. That's the colorful thing that I showed you in the 
slide previously. And any poor plant animal that plough holes in there, ants can't swim with the darn. That's what a feast when that thing lines up. So the type of organisms, the, the type of, pardon me, type of mouth that this organism has, and it's only one millimeter long, is pretty ferocious. The lower portion, see the three little bags together? Well, those open up. And they have big CD on them. Then when they collapse back, they hold things in place. The upper portion, that upper lip there, has teeth on and claws on the side. And the teeth in the middle on the jaws go back and forth more than 30 times a second, believe it or not. And they just rip everything up. So it can pick up and eat almost anything extremely well. Now let's look briefly at that herbivore that I've been talking about. Here's an organism that the food drifts around in the water. And those of you who swim, if you've ever tried to grasp something floating in the, below the surface, it's extremely difficult. When you reach for it, you're pushing water and you're actually pushing it away. So the problem that it has then is to try and concentrate those organisms. And there are two major groups in our waters that are extremely important, or were, less so now. And what they do is they eat the phytoplankton, and because the phytoplankton is making use of the sunlight, you find those herbivores primarily near the surface. And they use all of the appendages of the body, but primarily those around the mouth, to bring in the particles and concentrate them in this sort of fashion. The, red, the yellow arrows coming down are bringing particles from that long set of first antennae. And then the appendages around the mouth are actually circulating water and bringing the particles closer to, to the mouth. And there's a whole bunch of fuzzy pieces on the appendages near the mouth, and those are actually captured. Now let's turn that organism over, look at the underside of it. The upper lip, or labrum, is very similar to what we saw on TIG. It has all sorts of claws and things on it. That lower lip is like the two big bags on the lower portion of, of TIG. If we bring a copepod in, Copepods have glass houses on them. And so the organism can capture them, but it's got to be able to crush them some way. And when it eats it, and the mouth is that slot in there, the jaws come in close contact with it. Now, over time, they have evolved a covering on the surface of their jaws that allows them to break down the glass house. It actually is silica so that they have learned, evolved a way to, to break the, uh, the surface of this, this diatom. All right, one final brief discussion. Why are they important to the environment? I'll bring in euphosis to, because they're another extremely important group. But without cobots and without these euphosis or krill, the marine fish, the marine mammals would be missing unless something replaced them. And the most likely thing to replace them is jellyfish. And jellyfish are not good meals for tunas or anything else. Phytoplankton abundance would increase because they're not, the copepods are not eating the, the phytoplankton. And you can see evidence of this already. Now, these large blooms of phytoplankton are common, so they normally occur. The size of it, that's Ireland in the upper left. That's all of the UK, the West Coast. France, Spain. That gives you some idea of the size of these blooms. Without the uh, copepods and the euphosids eating the, those phytoplankton, the phytoplankton would die. And the organisms would sink, bacteria would take over, 
cause them to break down and put an, cause an anoxic, anoxic situation to develop. The water column would die. So copepods are great to have around. And you remember that they also play major roles in food chains and food webs. So they're good guys. Animals that play with the important roles, at least most of them are good guys. I'm not sure all of them are. So that's all, thank you.